You're always ready. It says preparing to live stream. Here we go. Great. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Mrs. Captain Dave, Captain Dave Stolfin and Will watching Safari. And we have a very special guest today, Michael Fishbach. And Michael is a friend of ours, of Captain Dave's and I, uh, Michael and his family, Heather and Galen. Uh, we've been blessed to uh, be um, their guests uh, in the Sea of Cortez at Loreto in Loreto, Mexico. And um, Michael is fascinating. He is an incredibly fascinating person. Hi, Michael. Hi, Giselle. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's so great to connect with you. And the reason I wanted to, ch you have so much going on all the time, but um, I I'd like to share with the folks who are watching, because if they haven't seen this, or if they have, they're going to say, oh my gosh, that's the guy. And if they haven't seen this, then they're missing one of the most incredible YouTube videos I've ever seen. So Michael had an experience, um, I think you told me it was back in 2011. Michael was on one of his annual trips. Michael, you go to the Sea of Cortez every year. You've been doing that for- 25 years. 25 years. And Michael goes out on these pongas with his family and some guests, and he does research on the different animals uh, that go to the Sea of Cortez in the wintertime. And he saw what he thought initially was a, um, a humpback whale that was completely encased in a uh, net and gear and um, it looked dead. And then it breathed. It was just floating on the surface and then it, it, it exhaled, right? And you went, it's alive. And this video is actually, um, on YouTube and we'll put in the notes below the link so you can go see the official video. A lot of people have copied it, which Michael has let people do so that the story can get out there. And um, it is a powerful story. You were with that well, and it was Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2011. So you named the whale. Valentina. Valentina. And this, is one of the most moving videos I've ever seen because you were with that whale for how many hours? Well, it took us about an hour to disentangle the whale. Um, I never thought in the beginning we would succeed at all and certainly didn't think we'd succeed in an hour. And then we spent about another hour with the whale after we disentangled it in which uh, it went humpback crazy as, as you guys have seen. You know. Yeah just breaching and flipper slapping and tail slapping all over the place. Yes. And it certainly appeared to be expressing at the minimum an exuberance of its freedom. Yeah. And of course, it's very easy to think that it was thanking us because we were there, but we have no proof of that because humpback whales do this, th these crazy, be you know, wild behaviors uh, at other times when they haven't just been rescued from a net. So it was incredible and it was extremely calm and it was a it was a very fortunate experience for one and all. And our video was very homemade, very non-professional. And in a lot of ways uh, that made it better. Yeah, well, it it it's a beautiful video if you ever want to watch it. It's just incredible. Um, you did something that we're always told never ever to do, which is <laughs> you actually strip down to your red bathing suit and you jumped in the water with this animal and um, you you assessed it and you thought, I I'm, I'm gonna do this. I cannot do this from the Ponga at the moment. I'm gonna go in and didn't have a lot of professional equipment. So this is not what's recommended for people at home. Don't do this, don't ever do this. And keep in mind, Michael had um, decades of experience being around whales but it was a very, it is a very, very powerful. So uh, Saving Valentina, we'll put the link down below and treat yourself to that after this, um, 
after watching this because it's definitely uh, uh, how many minutes really well spent. Eight, yeah, about eight yeah, minutes. Powerful, and, and very by powerful. the way, if any of you ever find an entangled whale, don't jump in the water, but alert the authorities who are professionally trained to disentangle the whale. Right. We did not have that option in our location. And it's a very long story why I went in the water and I probably wouldn't if the next time that this happened again. Yeah. But um, it's well, a, it's we're glad you did yeah. this time, but we're glad you're safe and that, you know, nothing happened. So, um, so Michael, tell us the other thing that you have experience with is, um, is, is protecting whales, being an advocate for whales. And you started um, a not for profit called the Great Whale Conservancy. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, um, I'd love to get back to Baja and this year when, when we're done. But yeah, the great, you know, after about 15, 16, 17 years of doing research on whales, I decided um, as I learned the plight of the world's great whales, which was not particularly a happy one compared to pre whaling, um, many of them were, were struggling to recover their numbers from, from pre whaling. I decided that if I was going to research these animals any further and I was gonna to continue to approach them the way we do on permitted scientific research boats, which is what we are in, in Mexico, um, that I, I needed to try to directly help them in order to justify being able to continue to do that. So the Great Well Conservancy is dedicated to um, improving the numbers and the plight of the world's great whales with a special emphasis on the blue whale. And in, in layman's terms, that means that we focus on trying to stop ship strikes and entanglements, which are two things that are keeping a number of species with the best examples probably being the world's right whales and blue whales from recovering toward their pre-whaling numbers. They are not able to recover because there's so many of them that are killed by ships and nets that you know they're just kind of hanging in there. Or in the case of the North Atlantic right whale, um, you know, I hate to say it, but you know they could be on their way out. Let's hope not. But right. so th so that's what we do at the Great Whale Conservancy, and it would take me 27 hours to explain the detail of of how we operate and how we try to get this difficult job done of getting industry and political uh, you know, entities to change their behavior to be more whale safe. Yeah. That's, that's what we do. Well, we appreciate what you have done and um, you have been instrumental in having some of the shipping lanes uh, changed. So um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, we've been instrumental in having some of the shipping lanes almost changed. Uh -huh. um, the shipping lanes that have been changed in the world are very few and far between. And a quick short list of the best, of the ones that have really been changed were for North Atlantic right whales in the Bay of Fundy, North Atlantic right whales in Boston Harbor, the Bay Area off California had a very significant change for blue whales, only the Bay Area, not the rest of the state. And then the number one example on planet Earth is Panama for humpback whales. They completely altered their shipping lanes on the Pacific side of the Panama Canal to stop ship strikes on humpback whales. It was a very successful uh, um, thing that happened in which the Panama, Panamanian government and the Panamanian whale bile just played a key role. And uh, other than that, um, there's a lot of struggles going on right now that we're involved in to get shipping lanes moved. I wish I could give you a concrete example of one that we did get moved. Um, hopefully soon I can, do, I, I can come back and I can give you one of those examples. Awesome. So, um... One of the things I wanted to do was, uh, we were talking about this, it was probably six or seven years ago now since we uh, came and spent time with you down in the Sea of Cortez. So you, um, you've been going now 25 years to the Sea of Cortez. And for those of you who don't know, the Sea of Cortez is on the east side of Baja. And it is in between the um, Baja Peninsula and the mainland of Mexico. 
it's a um, it's a beautiful uh, beautiful ecosystem, and you have been taking people down there now for um, these twenty five years, and you see something different every year. And I wanted to hear what you've been seeing lately, and what this season was like for you. Yeah, um, first of all, the Sea of Cortez is a very young sea and it is the richest sea, not ocean, sea on planet Earth for the diverse, the abundance and diversity of life with the Red Sea being second. And oh. they both have a similar shape, the Red Sea and the Sea of Cortez, long and narrow. Um, we have been seeing, I mean, our primary species down there are blue whales. Uh, we, our most common whale is a blue whale. Um, but we I'm see, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. The time of year that you're in the oh, Sea of Cortez is when? February and March every year. Okay. February and March. So our most common whale is a blue whale, but we have, it's the Sea of Cortez. We have fin whales and brutus whales and humpback whales and orcas and sperm whales and dwarf sperm whales and gray whales. You know, we have lots of whales. I've not even named them all. So um, lately, we have had a few years that have not been very impressive for that area. Uh, so the krill abundance has not been at, it, at its usual level. And being, at, it, being in the subtropics, it's actually unusual on planet Earth for something at that latitude to even be abundant and have whales that feed. So for example, humpback whales that leave Alaska can go to Hawaii to have their babies and they have to fast because there's no food in Hawaii. But the same humpback whales can change their strategy and go to Baja, California to have their babies, and many do. And while they're feeding and nursing those babies, they can feed themselves, mm. which many of them do. So it's a, it's a very interesting situation. We do see young calves nursing and we see adults pull away and start lunch feeding on krill or sardines or anchovies. It's, wow. it's, an, it's an amazing ecosystem. Last couple of years haven't been great. So we've seen more often things like humpbacks and fin whales lunging on sardines and anchovies because there hasn't been a lot of krill and those species can adapt their feeding strategies to feed on small fish. Mm. Blue whales cannot. Blue whales are not adaptable. They do not feed on small fish. So we've had less blue whales and um, the ones that have come have sort of stuck around for the whole season, but there haven't been many. This year, the place lit up again. It was, it was wow. abundant. It was full of whales. It was full of krill. The krill was raining up out of the surface of the water into the Yay. air. Animals were lunging through the water. There were many, many, many blue whales every day. We had one day with 30 to 35 blue whales that we saw in one uh -huh. day. Um, it was really exciting to see to see the, the, the sea in that state again. Yes. Um, conversely, I want to just say two other things. Of the 40 blue whales that we identified this year, 40 individuals, 24 of them show up on my ID pictures noticeably thin. In mm. other words, we can see the vertebral processes sticking up and some of the ver vertebrae themselves sticking up through the back. Um, so we can see an undulating pattern on the back of the fin whales that we had. And remember, they're adaptive feeders. The fin whales, not one out of 23 fin whales that we identified was thin. Every single fin whale was well fed and fat. Huh. And with the blue whales, 60% of them were thin. And that's not a Baja. You know, that's a situation where they're going to other feeding grounds throughout the year and they're arriving to the Sea of Cortez thin. So what's your theory on, on that? Or, or what is the theory as to why blue whales would be thin and fin whales wouldn't? Well, it's very simple. Fin whales that can adapt their feeding I strategy. see, okay. So if there isn't a lot of krill, the fin whales can take advantage of other abundances of right. life if right. it's small and the blue whales cannot. We've seen it. I mean, we've seen blue whales and humpbacks and fin whales together in a bad year when there's very little krill around. And we see the fin whales and the humpbacks just pounding away on the sardines and anchovies. 
and the blue whales might be a mile away and they're never going to come over. You know, the birds are there diving. It's very obvious what's going on. The dolphins are feeding, the birds are diving, the humpbacks are lunging, and the blue whales are a mile off to the side and they have nothing to do with that because they don't eat that food. Gotcha. So as more specific feeders, they rely on their food, which is very protein rich krill to be abundant where they go. And if it isn't, they have, they have problems. Gotcha. So Michael, we've got um, people who are posting questions and I'm okay. just um, taking a look here. One of the things the, that was asked is, are there volunteer opportunities with the Great Whale Conservancy? Um, the answer to the volunteer opportunity question is yes, but most people, when they think about volunteering, think about being on a boat on the water. And those are very few and far between because we do not spend much, much of the year on the water. And our research boat is relatively small and our team is relatively solid. So um, if anyone is interested in the, Galen, please keep it a little quiet, Galen. He's never up here. Anyway, um, uh, if people are interested in volunteering in other ways with data, with, um, with equipment, with writing, uh, editing, um, uh, even strategizing, even being on our board, because we are actually now actively looking for, for one or two new board members and possibly having those things lead to get out on a very exciting research boat. Uh, tell them to contact us. You've got okay. my email address, you yes. can post it. And um, okay. please do. We will post that uh, down below after after we're done with this. Um, someone asked, is there a connection between the amount of krill in the Sea of Cortez and the El Nino that we had last year? What do you think about that? Well, there's always a connection between El Nino and, and krill production because krill production is, is a byproduct of phytoplankton production which is of course connected to the economic value of whales that hopefully we will touch upon before we're done. And for, for phytoplankton to bloom, there has to be upwelling from mm. the bottom of the ocean, bringing those rich, rich nutrients up into the photic zone where they can mix with the critical minerals of phosphorus, iron, and nitrogen to keep a complex situation sort of more user-friendly and simple. And when we have an El Nino situation, it's going to change the upwellings. It's going to change the current. It's going to make things a little warmer. And generally speaking, productivity happens where things are a little colder. So the Arctic is more productive than the, than the, than the equator. Again, that's an extreme example. California is very productive because although you're sort of in a moderate latitude, you have an incredible, an incredible diversity of of bathymetry under the surface of the water and a lot of cool currents that are coming up towards your coast. And that's why Captain Dave's whale watching and Dana Point and other places in California are, are actually one of the best places in the world to go whale watching. It's very simple. If the phytoplankton wasn't around, right. you would not have the situation that you had. You have to have the phytoplankton production. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, you sent me a really a, a, a amazing paper, and um, I'd like to, to ask you to share a little bit of, about that, um, or a lot about that, if, if you would like. Um, yeah. Tell us what, this, this paper is titled, Whales, Nature's Solution to Climate Change. And yeah. when I read it, I, I could not believe some of the information that is in here. Tell us yeah. a little bit about what you discovered. Sure. Well, the story starts with me going into the offices of some of the largest shipping companies in the world and some of the largest retailers in the world who are involved in moving around the ships that are hitting whales and keeping their numbers from rebounding to their pre-whaling you know, densities. So one of the problems that we face when we talk to them and they do understand the, the, the ship strike problem. They understand what's going on. They understand the solutions that we offer. But one of the problems is it costs money for them to alter their behavior. 
So in other words, alter their routes or alter their timing or whatever. So for us to negate or counteract the fact that this um, cost them money to save whales, um, we enlisted some very prominent economists to help us figure out how much whales are worth. What are the things that whales do that offer value to me and to you, Giselle, and to everyone that, that is listening? And those things are actually somewhat obvious. First of all, and this, I'm not gonna get into it. People just have to trust me. Whales stimulate phytoplankton blooms, which is the greatest photosynthesis mechanism on earth. They do it via their mineral rich feces. That means that a lot of, as the greatest photosynthesis mechanism on earth, the phytoplankton pulls a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. We have a climate crisis on this planet. We're only gonna fix it by pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. So there is a value, carbon has a value. The International Monetary Fund who's involved in this has a value for carbon. So for each ton of carbon that's pulled out of the atmosphere via a whale's existence, there's a value. Whales also have tons of carbon in their bodies. When they die, they bring that carbon down to the bottom of the ocean. That has a value. Whales all also, or one of the most, one of the greatest stimulators of tourism of any animal on planet Earth. I don't think I need to explain that to you or your audience. And of all of the animals that stimulate tourism, they are the international animal. One whale in certain parts of the world can go to 10 or 15 countries. We intend to try to designate them to be an international public good. And finally, because phytoplankton is the base of the entire marine food web. Everything alive in the ocean is dependent on phytoplankton for its life. It's the base of the food chain. That means that more whales mean more phytoplankton, mean more fish, more fisheries, richer fisheries. So the economists have used whale numbers to equate the, the carbon part of it, the touristic part of it, and the fisheries part of it, and come up with an economic value per whale. And that is the foundation of, of this incredible thing that we're now doing, which by the way, we presented in January at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Which is uh, amazing. So Michael, drum roll, the estimated value of the whales in the world was is coming in at. Okay, and I, first of all, I wanna tell everyone when you hear this figure, I'm pretty sure that this figure is low. Conservative. We had to be conservative on the first round here because this is a, you know, a little bit of a new idea. And so the, the conservative figure that we have for the whales that are alive today, $1 trillion. Wow. One trillion dollars. And how many whales do they estimate are alive right now? Um, about one and a third million. Million. Wow. Maybe as much as one and a half. Pre whaling, four and a half million, possibly as much as five million. Wow. Um, and when you factored, when you, when you came up with this valuation in terms of the carbon uh, contributions and uh, the fisheries. Was tourism also factored in to that number? Oh yeah, yeah, I said that. I said oh, tourism. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. It was fisheries, tourism, and carbon. And, Got it. And tourism, Got it. you know, tourism, we have to remember whale watching now is about a hundred countries in the world, yeah. uh, a multi-billion dollar industry. And part of our solution strategy is to actually help the touristic activities of the countries that agree to save their whales, that we will go in and then try to enhance their tourism vis-a-vis -vis right. whale watching. And we have to remember that whales are not only getting killed in wealthy countries that have more ships probably going by them, they're getting killed in very poor countries as well. Mm -hmm. And there is almost no nation on earth that's coastal, in case your listeners are interested, that does not have whales visit it at some part of the year. It's almost 100% of the coastal nations on earth. And I mm -hmm. have done that research myself for the economists that did this paper. Wow, well, thank you for doing that. So 
Um, there's a, there's so much to talk about, but I want to be respectful of your time. Um, you shared with me that you saw something you had never seen in 25 years in the Sea of Cortez. You said, I've never seen this behavior. And so um, you saw it with an animal that we're very familiar with here in Dana Point. Sure. Sure. So tell us a little bit about that event. Okay, well, when we think of gray whales in Baja, California, um, probably many of your listeners know that we tend to think of the um, Scammons Lagoon, San Ignacio Lagoon, and Magdalena Bay, the three lagoons that they go to to, to have their young. And, and rear their young before they make the long migration north. So we're pretty spoiled down at Baja because when we go to one of those lagoons, we get to see these animals really close really up. Close, and we right? have that experience with you yeah. even. So, um, so we don't tend to see a lot of gray whales around the other side. So the lagoons are on the Pacific side of Baja. If you want to get into the Sea of Cortez, you've got to go all the way down to Cabo San Lucas and then come up the other side. We don't see a lot of gray whales on our side, but occasionally, you know, we'll see some gray whales in a given year. Well, this year we went into a beautiful bay called San Basilio Bay that we don't go into very often. And we mainly went in there just to sort of have a look and go to the beach because there's some nice beaches in there. Just show everyone this bay and go to the beach because it's really unusual to see a whale in this bay. And we're actually heading to the beach and we're about a hundred yards from the beach and there's a spout in front of us. And there is a young gray whale and we can't believe our eyes. You know, there's this young gray whale is about 70 yards from the beach. And the next thing we see is we see the gray whale dive and we sort of see something going on, but we're not sure what it is, but I have a hunch. So we put our drone up. And that gray whale was bottom feeding in that bay. We spent two hours with it. We have video of it twisting its body into the bottom of the bay, mud coming up. We have body video of it at the surface swimming along with mud pouring out of its mouth. It was eating wow. anthropods and crustaceans. We're not sure what. We actually hope next year to test the mud right where it was feeding in the bottom of the bay to see what it was feeding on. But this animal was feeding in a bay in the Sea of Cortez. And as far as we know and have been told, it is the first documented case of a gray whale bottom feeding anywhere in the Sea of Cortez ever. Wow. Wow. So it was pretty, it was pretty exciting and our videos very good, very good. Yeah, no, that's that's incredibly exciting. I um you you sent me some great pictures and I wish I could share them with everyone, but it is not um it is not letting me do the share. I don't know why, but my little share button disappeared. So I might have done something to disable it. I don't I I'm sorry about that, but you had some really cool pictures of flukes and um one of them is um, a blue whale and it's got an enormous chunk out of its tail. Uh, what do you think that is? Well, we, um, I've actually discussed this with you know, a couple of the, uh, the most experienced blue whale biologists in the world. Um, and it's a tough one, I have to say. Usually they have theories pretty quickly. You know, a lot of these things that we see like We'll see a hole in the fluke of a blue whale. I'm sure you've seen yes. it. it. Might be a small hole below, you know, below the trailing edge. Not, a, you know, a hole, so it's not attached to the outside. Right. It'd be a nick if it was attached to the outside. You know, we're we're starting to think um, because it, it's really hard to imagine if it's not something like a cookie cutter shark, which you know in some cases it isn't. How these holes and these even these nicks happen. And it seems, uh, the leading theory seems to be parasites. Parasites that just kind of eat into the tail and thin and weaken the skin. And then over time, they either eat through or little pieces fall out. This particular whale, um, it is very difficult to, to, to try to, to be accurate about what it is, but the best guesses, I think the number one best guess would be that when it was young, it was entangled in, mm. in a net and the net cut through its tail and um, it just worked through in a certain way. And then, you know, somehow 
through the whales movement, you know, the net eventually came out, but it, we just can't be sure. Right, right. Well, it's, um, um, I do have someone who's asking, is there a link um, to where people can see the bottom feeding that you, you saw um, with the gray whale? Do you have that up anywhere? We have it up private right now. Okay. Um, so we will let you know if and when we unprivatize that. Okay. There's already some, some feature film interest. One of the things that, that people need to understand about researchers like us and conservationists like us, we struggle a little bit to make a living. And one of the things that can fall into our pockets are rare footage. Yeah. Um, and when we get it, we need to try to take advantage of it to supplement our, our livelihood. So since this is so recent, recent, we have not made it public yet, trying to keep potentially its value, um, but it's going to get out there soon and we will let you know and let these folks know um, through you. You can let them know when, when we do that. I'm sorry, everyone, that we don't post everything immediately. Well, it's very understandable, Michael, and um, you guys are awesome. You, um, we love your family and, and the work that you're doing. Um, is there anything else you wanted to share with our, uh, our family over here? Um, well, I think, it's, uh, I think it's very important to note for the people that are listening, who I presume most all of them come from Southern California. Um, Some, that, yeah. Yeah, or, or, you know, a good percentage of them come from mm -hmm. California, that, that you all live in an area and go out in an area where you see whales. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, to the south of your area of Dana Point, those whales are relatively safe. And they're in a, they're in a good part of the world to be spending part of their lives in and feeding in. In the Sea of Cortez, it's about the best place and the safest place on earth for blue whales to be. When you begin to travel north from Dana Point, it gets very dangerous for blue whales. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, it's very productive. And they, are, um, they have evolved to go for the productivity. They have the biggest bodies in the world, blue whales, and they're gonna go where the food is. And I would encourage you all to educate yourself either through our website or contacting us or reading on your own, um, some of the issues that are happening right off the port of LA and Long Beach, which is very close to you, um, right in the Channel Islands, uh, off Santa Barbara and Ventura, which is another very difficult spot for blue whales, but very productive, as is the port area. And, and actually even up off Monterey Bay and through the, the, um, the Bay Area. Um, I think in order for this situation to, to change and for these whales to multiply, which they are very capable of doing, we need all the people that are interested in whales in California to become educated about what's really going on out there because it's not great what's going on out there in general. It's great to go see the whales that are alive, but you all should have three times as many whales off California as you do. You have one of the best places in the world for whales to be seasonally. And one of my goals in life is to see those California whales increase in number. And I hope that you all can, can think about wanting the same thing and maybe getting a little bit involved because we need Californias in Californians, the people yes. of California involved to help the whales of California. Yes, and, and I think you, you said it beautifully before, and they're not just the whales of California. Although it's they cool. might be called the California gray whales, they, they bridge you know, countries and yeah. blue whales, yeah. certainly, you know, many countries, humpback whales, many countries, many fin, countries. Um, minky, minky whales, all, all of these animals, um, you know, will touch. I think at one point you said, uh, how many countries the average whale goes to? Well, let's just take very quickly a humpback whale that you might see off California. So that's a humpback whale that might go through British Columbia up to Alaska. 
It certainly might go down through Mexico. And some of those humpback whales are known to go as far south as Panama in wow. some years. Let's start adding you know, all the Central American countries plus the North American countries. So you're seeing at times humpback whales that visit 10 countries in one year. Wow. The ones in the, in the uh, Eastern Atlantic that go from Europe off West Africa, and some of them even go over to South America, I believe that, that we're easily for some of them at 15 countries. So when mm -hmm. you protect a California whale, you're not only helping the whole world with the climate crisis, you're helping the people of Guatemala and El Salvador and Panama to have more fish for their families. Right. And you're helping whale watching in um, Costa Rica to have another animal for their customers to see, right. as well as, of course, Captain Dave's in California. So it, it is, um, we want this to become a responsibility that each group of people in their geographical area take on for the good of all. That's what we want. That's our mission. And that's why we're doing the economic value of the whale. We believe that it is, it is going to get us over the hump with this yeah. mission. Oh, it's powerful. And I love the angle that you've taken because when you start talking money, people do start to pay attention and it's how you can get the powers that be to make fresh decisions to look at things with a, with a newer critical eye. I think that was brilliant. So thank you for, for doing that. Well, thank you, Michael, for joining us. We will go ahead and put links below and um, you can let us know when and if that video gets. Um, I've got a couple of comments here. Um, is the paper that you presented at Davos available online and where? The, we didn't present a paper at Davos. We presented a slideshow and a theory that was related to a paper. And that paper, um, well, you have copies of the paper. Uh -huh. As far as that paper being online, that I actually don't know because that's the up to the economists. I don't know if they put it online, but we are absolutely have the freedom to send that paper out. Okay. So you can post that paper on your website or you can give me somebody's email address and I can just attach it and send it to them. Okay, thank you. We can chat later about what the best way is to do that. And then yep. um, that was from Tracy Hartman. Um, and then Mary Wong said, uh, thank you for your energy and your efforts to keep our amazing cetaceans to continue to ply the oceans of the world. Great way to begin Earth Day week. Right? Yes, I forgot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a great day to be in Earth Day week. So, um, yeah, what an honor. Thank, thank you, Mary. You, Mary, thank you, Mary, for considering yes, thank you, Mary. a positive part of Earth Day week. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. We really appreciate your time and keep us posted on what's, uh, what's happening. Yes, and we'll try to get more stuff posted because I can see that. Uh, that people that are engaged and interested want to see more. And yes. we are not always the champions at, at posting everything. <laughs> uh, well, I think public. that the, the press release you sent me um, at the very least is something we can probably put in the notes below and Absolutely. I'll, I'll, Absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll see if Danielle can do that and, and we can get that information out there. So thank you. And I sent you the paper. I sent you the economic value paper yes. as well. And yes. you are free to share that. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Michael. Say hi to Heather and Galen for us and Dave and Ariel send their, send their love and we'll see you soon. Them, please give them our best. And uh, next time we're out, uh, we'll give you a holler. Oh, we've been as flying, always. Yeah, we've been flying to Cabo and driving up the last few years. We haven't been driving down. So we have, I haven't been to Southern California in four years. But the wow. next time I'm out, we'll, we'll give you a shout and maybe Dinner. meet some of the folks that were listening today. That sounds great. And dinner and all that. We so. would love that. You know, yeah. I, I do have a question. You had a huge blue whale for a while yeah. that you took from place to place. Whatever happened to that whale? It's stored uh, 10 minutes from here and it's still available. But, you know, here, here's the deal, right? The deal is it is a really big deal. It's a blue whale. It's an adult blue whale life size. It wow. is a big deal to transport this thing and it needs uh, a significant amount of money 
yeah. um, to support the, the display of it publicly, right. and the shipping of it and all of that. We still have it. Um, it's uh, the last time we used it was about a year ago. It's still in fine shape, awesome. ready to show anyone that wants to see what a blue whale looks like life size. We're, well, you we're know, um, uh, we should we should talk about that because next year, Dana Point, um, which got the trademark this year for the dolphin and whale watching capital of the world, don't you know? Wow, we, I didn't yeah, know. yeah. I mean, there are lots of wonderful places to go dolphin and whale watching in the world, but we submitted nine criteria and we were very blessed after about 18 months to get the designation so there are other places i think that are amazing too but we've got the trademark so we're going to go with that and you know when it comes to year round dolphin and whale watching with our megapods of 5,000 dolphin, 10,000 dolphin, and the variety of whales that we see, how close we are to these deep coastal canyons. You know, our year-round weather is incredible, so you can get yeah. out there year-round and see the animals. I could keep going with, with all the criteria. But one of the things that does, uh, that does distinguish us from other great places to go is that Dana Point actually had the first whale festival um, was here in Dana Point, and that was uh, 50 years ago. And it is the only place in the world that has had a whale festival every year. So the 50th festival uh, will be celebrated in March of 2021. So we're looking for some really big deal things to do. So we'll have to talk about maybe getting your blue whale out of, uh, out of storage and bringing it down because I think letting people see how big a blue whale really is up close is it's, it's unbelievable. Well, it's uh, you know I'll just say one thing: when we see blue whales in the water, we see them a little bit fleetingly. We see yeah. part of their body usually, and yeah. it's awesome, right? Yeah. But when we have an inflatable blue whale that's been done well and really looks like a blue whale on land, we can walk around. We can look at the whale from different angles. We can lie down under the head of the whale. The ventral plates wow. are there, they're painted in. We can, look at, we can look at a blue whale in a way that we're never gonna get to look at a blue whale. Right. And it's all gonna be relatively accurate. So it is, it is something every time we inflate it, um, I kind of, you know, as, as it's going up, I kind of go, that's, you know, mine. I mean, we actually built this thing <laughs> with, with some great people, but you know what we, you know, this yeah. is our thing. It's, yeah. It's this some, is my blue whale. Not too many yeah, people can say they have a blue whale. Right, right. I got a blue whale in storage over here. I don't even live on the coast and I got a blue whale over there in storage. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, thank you, Michael, again, and we'll see you soon. Okay, sounds great. All right, take care. Take care. Thank you My everyone pleasure. for joining us. We really yeah. appreciate it. And uh, next uh, Thursday, we have got um, Jeff Pantakoff, the whale man, um, who will be joining us and telling us about his experiences down in San Ignacio Lagoon this year, cool. as well as what's going cool. on with his not-for-profit. Yeah. Well, okay. everyone, thanks a lot. Thank you. you. A great job for your oh, first uh, episode. My first you one. Know, okay. Episode. Thank you. Okay. You're awesome. Bye -bye. Thank you, Michael. Bye-bye.